about lighthouses is that some of them fly, but only very special ones. My own uh, qualifications, if you like, for uh, being able to talk about lighthouses is that um, in my youth, I was heavily involved in lighthouses. Just in case you can't make it out, I'm the one standing on the wall. It's my first birthday and my father was a lighthouse keeper. During World War II, he'd been in the army and uh, on a troop ship headed for the Mediterranean for North Africa. And just off the coast of Oran, the ship was torpedoed. And uh, it took several hours and he was several decks down, being one of the lower ranks. He was also on the lower decks. And uh, the ship was listing and flooding and it must have been terrifying, but uh, they got them all off and uh, got them all ashore. And when he left the army after the war, a lighthouse keeper was a good job, A, because there was a shortage of housing. It was hard to find a place to stay and uh, a lighthouse provided free accommodation. And B, you could torpedo a lighthouse as often as you liked, but it wasn't going to sink. So I think that was the reason that he took up lighthouse keeping. And I spent my first birthday on a little tricycle for part of the time, uh, but I couldn't go very far because this is the island on which the lighthouse sat. It's the island of Plada, and in the background is the island of Arran. You may know Arran sweaters. It's nothing to do with this island. It's from another set of islands off the coast of Ireland, but this one is in the Firth of Clyde. So every sailor who's ever gone up the Clyde into Glasgow will have passed by this little lighthouse. Um, these days, because lighthouses are automatic, it's in a bit of a sorry state, but it is somewhat unusual in that there are actually two towers there. Uh, in the foreground is the uh, compressor room for the foghorn that's front and left. This is the foghorn down here. The uh, accommodation block is over here. And because there was no electricity to the island, to the island this is the engine room where typically three diesel engines were sat and each day one was started up to provide power for the lighthouse. They ran for 24 hours and then rested for 48 hours. So that was part of the, the rigmarole, if you like, of life on a lighthouse. Later on, I moved from Plada, and here's Plada, down here at the, the south end of the island of Arran, on the approach going into Glasgow. But as a student, I had a perfect summer job for me, at, at least. Um, I was a summer relief keeper, first of all, on Ruval Lighthouse, and secondly, on Heisker Lighthouse. Now, it was the summer, but traditionally, lighthouse keepers didn't spend all that long on the lighthouse. In, in my day, they spent six weeks on and three weeks off. And I was out there for 12 weeks which meant that I could allow uh, four light keepers to go off on three weeks holiday in turn. And that's basically the job. You're out there for 12 weeks solid. And the lighthouse keepers were sympathetic uh, to the summer relief people because six weeks was usually enough for them. You know, they had families to go back to. Well, as a, a student, you don't have a family to go back to. <laughs> You're on your own and it's a perfect job because they feed you, they house you. There's nowhere to spend any money. And at the end of the summer, at the end of 12 weeks, you get a nice little check. So as a summer job, it was hard to beat. So there's part of my qualifications for talking about lighthouses. Uh, the other is that I also had an uncle who was a lighthouse keeper all his life, and I visited him on several lighthouses. And you can imagine, your nephew arrives, he knows lighthouses, it means you can sleep in and get your nephew to do your watch overnight, especially when it's a quiet night and there's not much happening. Or, and I'll explain this later, you can send your young nephew to do the wind and save your legs. We'll explain what that means later on. So those are three lighthouses that I had, the, if you like, the most experience of. This is Ruval. It sits at the north end of the island of Isla and it has a wall all the way around it. All of the lighthouses have walls all the way around, uh, partly to keep the sheep out. In this case, it was mainly to keep the sheep out. But in others, um, it's to make sure the lighthouse keepers don't get blown away in gales in the winter. So it offers a little bit of protection. And if you are blown off your feet, at least you'll end up against the wall rather than on the, 
you know, the cliffs uh, or the water below. This is the accommodation block in here, and at the end, the inevitable engine room. Although this is on a big island, and although it did have a telephone line, uh, it didn't have any power, and there was no road to it, so you were kind of stuck out there. Uh, it's now a private house, hence the rather nice looking garden round it. And this is it from another angle, it's not such a good photograph. You can and see a track here and that track literally goes to a little jetty down here just off the uh, the picture and that's where the stores were landed uh, where the relief keeper the relieving keeper uh, would come on and off where the diesel fuel was landed in 40 gallon oil drums uh, that was the communication with the outside world apart from the telephone high school was completely different the reason that uh, there was a light here is because as you see it's pretty low and from a small boat it's hard to see especially at high tide and particularly in bad weather when there are waves so the lighthouse was an important uh, marker and, and there really just is not much out there this is it from uh, from a drone and these days of course they have a helicopter pad for servicing it uh, but this is the path that takes you down to the little jetty where the boat comes in and unloads people and food fresh milk um, and stores. And here is a path that crosses a couple of bridges and goes away out to the far end of the island. We'll get to that in a minute. This island doesn't have much grass, but when I got there they had three goats, one of which was milked. And the first thing they asked me when I stepped ashore was, do you know how to milk a goat? Well, I said, I know how to milk a cow, so milking a goat can't be all that different. And there was a huge sigh of relief because if I hadn't known how to milk a goat or wasn't willing to milk a goat, then somebody else would have had to get up. You know, when I was on watch, somebody else would also have had to get up and milk the goat every morning. But the good thing was we had fresh milk every day. So you had fresh milk in your cornflakes every morning, courtesy of the goat. But there's not much on this island. It's really a series of, of rocks. And here's the lighthouse and that patch of grass and the helicopter pad sits at the back. And the path with the bridges takes you all the way out here to the foghorn. Now, because there's a foghorn there, you need three keepers. If there wasn't a foghorn, this would be a two keeper light. Uh, the foghorn is there. So you need three keepers because one does a light watch in the light room, making sure the light is going. One is on foghorn watch, making sure that the foghorn is sounding and one is off. So if it's a foggy day, a foggy night, I should say, then you do th four hours on the light, four hours on the foghorn and you get four hours sleep. And then you're back for four hours on the light and four hours on the foghorn. And not that you have to blow the hot foghorn, you understand, I mean, it's all automatic. Uh, it works by electricity, but you just have to be there to make sure the pressure is right, that there are no leaks developing in the system, and that it's sounding the way it should. Looking after the light is much the same. You're basically there to make sure the light stays on and doesn't go out. But the winter before I got there, a big storm had washed away one of these bridges, and that's the replacement that we built. So I have a lot of sweat equity in that particular bridge. And you can see from this island that the goats could make a living out of this island, but not much else could. Certainly a cow would starve to death on this island, but the goats could make it. In the background is the uh, island of Rum, which is a, a much bigger island. It's about maybe nine miles away from uh, Heisker. One of the good things about being on Heisker is that uh, fishing boats uh, some of the fishing boat crews were very religious and they wouldn't fish on a Sunday, but they would come out and lie off Heisker near their fishing grounds. And they might sometimes come close and throw us half a loaf of fresh bread. Ah, oh, manna. Or yesterday's newspaper. Equally welcome. So why do we have lighthouses? Well, that's a nice obvious one. They, uh, they're basically navigation aids marking things like the entrances to harbours. There's usually something on the end of a pier to tell them this is where to go and to tell them which side to go to. If you're out in the Atlantic, then uh, a lighthouse, when you sight a lighthouse in the old days, that was very welcome because that would enable you to tell where you were. If you'd been sailing or uh, going through bad weather for a few days and couldn't get a star sight, 
uh, or a, a sight of the, the sun or anything, the lighthouse would confirm where you are. And, and in the case of Heisker, for example, they mark dangerous rocks and uh, shoals. And it's important that the light is visible in bad weather, because that's when you need it most, when the sun is shining and everything's fine. You don't really need them so much, but in bad weather, you really did. This is, remember, before the days of radar and DECA and LORAN and all these other navigational aids, long before GPS was even a, 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 a twinkle in the eye of whoever invented it. So lighthouses, lighthouses have to be simple and they have to be reliable. The biggest offence that you can uh, commit as a lightkeeper is to let your light go out. That, that's as bad as a, somebody on radio and dead air. Um, it's actually worse because dead air doesn't cost us somebody's life. This might. It could easily have cost somebody their life. The oldest lighthouse, or at least the oldest famous lighthouse, is the Pharos at Alexandria in Egypt. And uh, well earned uh, its place as one of the wonders of the ancient world. This is roughly what it looks like. Uh, it isn't standing at the moment, and so this is a reconstruction from the bits that they've rescued from the sea of Alexandria, which is where the remains of this lighthouse now lie. And you can see that it's a tall tower, so there's some kind of fire at the top that can be seen from quite a distance out at sea. But clearly this is built to impress. The function of being a navigation aid to mariners is almost eclipsed by the function of impressing the oncoming shipboard uh, personnel that this is an important country that they're approaching. So this is style uh, taking precedence over function. Nevertheless, it was high enough to be seen well out to sea and it did fulfill the function, the classic function of lighthouses. We've already introduced you to Plada down here, Raval and Heiske. In a moment, we're going to look at the Flannan Isles, which is one of these landfall lighthouses for ships coming in from North America across the Atlantic. And then we're going to go up to the Shetland Islands and look at two lighthouses up here. But first, why, what, what is it that enables a lighthouse like the one behind me uh, that you may have seen at the beginning, Skerry Vor, uh, which just sticks up out of the ocean? What gives lighthouses their strength? If they're up on top of cliffs, they're almost certainly built of brick. But if you're on a, a reef that is constantly washed over by the sea and occasionally by very, very stormy seas, you need to be very, very strong. And lighthouses are essentially a three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. Each layer of rock, and it's typically granite, which as we know is a very strong rock, it's typically granite blocks that are carved to shape and brought out to the site and fitted together. So there has to be some precision cutting and chiseling and so on to get them to that shape. And you can see if you look here, uh, neither of these blocks is going to go out because they're pinched here. It's wider here than it is here. So these blocks aren't going to slide out. And this bit here shows the same. There's, this is not going to slide past this. So each layer is locked together like the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And vertically, we have dowels that peg the layers together. And each layer is held together by several dowels. So no two layers are free to slide one across the other. So that makes lighthouses tremendously strong, it makes them difficult to build. You need craftsmen to do this kind of work, certainly in the days when they were built before power tools and things. Uh, and it took a while, and the most dangerous bit was getting the base built on rocks that were often swept by the sea, even in relatively calm weather. But this is the kind of lighthouse that's built with that three-dimensional uh, structure. And off the coast of France is a lighthouse that uh, clearly had to be exceptionally strong. This was taken from a helicopter which was out photographing some lighthouses off the coast of Brittany, where there are some pretty dangerous and uh, stormy seas. 
and the lightkeeper came out to see what the helicopter was doing. And as the helicopter crew watched, this huge wave descended on the other end of the lighthouse. And the lighthouse keeper, looking at the helicopter and hearing the helicopter noise, wasn't at first aware of the size of this wave that was about to engulf him. And eventually he caught sight of it. It must have been a fraction of a second later. He caught sight of the, the water surging past, realized that he was in danger and managed to get inside and slam the, sh the door shut just before the water crashed all around. Now look how high this wave is. Here's the first floor, here's the next floor. So it's three floors up, it's way up here. Had he stayed in there, he, he would have been killed and the helicopter crew were, thought it was miraculous that he managed to get that door shut in time. It is a steel door and uh, pretty strong and I'm sure it leaked a little bit that day and uh, he was lucky to escape with, with his life. But lighthouses like this have to be strong enough to withstand those kind of waves. We'll come back to waves a wee bit later on. The light from the lighthouse has to be focused in order to get to, uh, to be seen as far away as possible. And lighthouses use this Fresnel lens. Uh, a conventional lens on the right is, is big and thick. And if you break that, there's a problem. The whole thing basically has to be replaced. Uh, Fresnel light is, uh, lenses can be built in little sections. So if one little bit breaks, it really doesn't matter that much and it, you can probably carry a spare. So lighthouses use these Fresnel lenses. And typically they're built into a framework like this. Uh, the older ones cast iron, the uh, more recent one of lighter metals. But you can see little different strips of metal held in place to form the lens. And in the middle, more, a more conventional lens right in the middle. And this is what we call a fixed lens. It just sits there and the light goes on and off to create a flash pattern. Fixed lights and flash patterns. Well, fixed lights tend to be the ones that you see at harbour entrances and maybe on minor headlands and so on. Flashing lights tend to be the ones that mark landfalls and the flash pattern is unique to each lighthouse. So if you see one that's doing two short flashes and one long, you can look up the book and see where you are. Or you can look up the book beforehand and be looking for that two shorts and one long flash pattern and hope that that's what you see. And if you see something else, you know that your navigation isn't right as accurate as you hoped it might be. How do we get the flash pattern? Uh, oops, we're going the wrong way. The flash pattern in the early days, when all you had was a steady light, typically a, a kerosene light, uh, in order to get the flash pattern, you had to rotate the lens and you had to build the lens so that it gave you the appropriate flash pattern. Uh, more recently, electric lights could do the flash and so the, the lens could sit there. Now, how do you rotate these lenses? That lens that we saw a moment ago is, is pretty big and heavy. Well, here's the answer to that. The whole thing sits in a on top of a ring and the ring itself floats in a trough, a circular trough of mercury. Mercury means that because mercury is so dense, almost anything will float in it. And secondly, if it's floating in that mercury, it's almost frictionless. So to get the lens rotating, you just give it a wee shove with your shoulder and you'll get it moving. And then to keep it moving, you need some simple, reliable mechanism that will keep that thing rotating at a steady speed. So that if you're the, the mariner expe is expecting short, short, long, he doesn't end up with short, short, long, or short, short, long, if you see what I mean. So a simple mechanism to give a reliable rotation speed and give it just enough energy to keep it going. Well, the obvious answer is clockwork. And on the left, we've got a clockwork mechanism in a lighthouse. And top right is the weight. Now, you know how grandfather clocks work. They have two weights and every week or so, 
you have to wind the thing. And basically what you're doing is winding the heavier of the two weights up to the top so that it can spend the week going down. And that is the energy that keeps the clock going. Well, in a lighthouse, in an old lighthouse like this, you wind up the big weight. And as it descends through the tower, that energy is what keeps the lens rotating. The taller the tower, the further that weight has to travel and the longer it takes. And if you as the lighthouse, lighthouse keeper have to go back there and wind this weight up by hand, which is what you do, because they weren't going to spend money on electric motors and things like that when there was a man going to be there who could wind it back up. The taller the tower, the longer the wind. Remember I said Rouval was a nice tall tower and that was important because it gave, well, you can now see it's important because it gives you a long wind time. And that's important because officially the lighthouse keeper was supposed to sit his lighthouse watch, his lightroom watch, at the top of the tower, where there typically was no TV, where typically there was no radio, no kettle, no coffee, no tea, no sandwiches. So 99% of the time, the light keepers were really to be found down in the kitchen or down in the living room with the, the radio on quietly so that you didn't wake up everybody else who was asleep. If you're doing the midnight to 4 a.m. watch, then you go around pretty quietly because you don't want to wake people up and you go up to the light room when you have to. And if it's a long wind, then it's only every 35 or 40 minutes that you have to dash up the stairs. You realize now why my uncle was always happy to see me. I could get up the stairs in my youth. I suppose I still could, but in my youth, I could get up these stairs quite easily, do the wind and get back down, saving his somewhat older legs for, uh, another day. Short, stubby lighthouses were never all that popular you know, because the wind might be as little as 20 minutes. So every 20 minutes you've got to trek up there, which I suppose encouraged you to stay up there maybe a wee bit more often. You might take a book up there and, and read it. Okay, to the Flannan Isles, way out west. Well, the Flannan Isles are easy to miss and even when you see them, they're not exactly inviting. These are a series of little rocks that stick up out of the Atlantic. And on top of the highest one is this lighthouse. Uh, winter storms every, not every winter, but every two or three winters would send waves almost up to that lighthouse. It's a pretty windswept area. We can see a little path coming down here and then steeply descending out down here to a landing. This is where the supplies would come ashore, where the relieving light keeper would come ashore. And they have this steep bit up here and then a concrete path all the way to the top. And in fact, they have two landings, one on the east side, which is the more sheltered side, and one on the west for those occasions when the wind happens to blow the other way. And because of the steepness here, they actually had a cable that ran down here and could pull up little little wagons on a, on a narrow gauge railway. And so, for example, the 40 gallon oil drums could be pulled up with this winch. This is showing the landing maybe a, a little more. And you can see the difference between the waves here, which look a lot rougher than the waves here, where you've got a little bit of shelter from the rock itself. And if we look from above, you can see there's the, the, the rail on the path down to the east landing, and here's the path down to the west landing. The Flannan Isles would be otherwise pretty unremarkable, but in 1900, in December of 1900, a ship coming in from the Atlantic noticed that the light was off. It was dark. That's a problem. So when the boat reached civilization, when the ship came in, they reported it to the authorities. The message was sent up to Edinburgh to the head headquarters of the Northern Lighthouse Board, which looks after lighthouses in Scotland and the Isle of Man. And they sent out a ship to find out what was wrong. The ship got out there and there was nobody to meet them at the East Landing. They went up to the lighthouse and there was no trace of any of the three men who should have been there. Not a trace. 
And that's unusual because on a lighthouse like the Flannans, the rule is that whatever's going on, two men handle it, one man always stays up at the light. So if anything happens to the other two, at least there's somebody left to keep the light going. Remember, the cardinal sin is that the light goes out. Well, when they got up there, they found a, a mystery worthy of the Mary Celeste. There was a meal on the table, untouched, and the wet weather gear of one keeper was hanging on the peg at the door. Now that fits with the instruction that one man stays. And so what seems to have happened is that the two men were out, uh, the other two were out dealing with something at the landing, securing ropes, wet, bad weather was coming, and something happened to them. And the third man, disobeying the rule, ran out to help and either tripped and fell down that steeper part towards east, the either landing or maybe the wind simply blew him away quite literally blew him off his feet and over the side of the the cliffs to his death we never did find out nobody will ever know what really happened to those three men but uh, it's a mystery about which a poem has been written and, and about which many people have speculated and it's certainly a moral uh, tale that is always told to young light keepers, just in case. Okay, we'll turn to the US. Uh, and there are no prizes for this one, but just think, what do you think is the state that has the most lighthouses? Within the USA, which state has the biggest number of lighthouses? Well, if you said Maine, you're wrong. And if you said Washington, you're wrong. But if you said Michigan, you're right. Michigan has 115 lighthouses, uh, which basically means you can't sail around Michigan without seeing a lighthouse somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure if that's a testament to poor navigational skills that they need so many or or what it is. But anyway, Michigan has 115 lighthouses, more than any other state in the US. I'm hoping that's one of the 10 things you didn't already know. Okay, you've seen the name. But what is a muckle flugger? Well, the first thing I have to say is that when I mention this name in this country, some people mishear it and think I'm saying something else, but I'm not. The word muckle in Scottish means big. So muckle, it's something big. And a flugger uh, comes from Old Norse. Shetland is the most recent part of Scotland. It, it became part of Scotland only in 1469. Until then, it was uh, owned by Norway. And so its culture to this day is heavily Norse influenced. And as you'll see in a moment, uh, it's not a place where English or the Gaelic language um, prevail. It, it has language and, and names all of its own. So Muckleflugger means the big precipice, cliff, uh, that kind of thing. And we find it, remember, way up in the north. It's the most northerly bit way up here uh, at the north end of the Shetland Islands. And here are the Shetland Islands and uh, maybe you can see these names that don't uh, look like English names and they don't look like Gallic names. Uh, it's the Norse influence. The, the wick, Lerwick, the wick bit means um, a, a bay. Um, and Burra, well, you, you're familiar with that, but that comes from Old Norse and it refers to a town. So the south town, Sumbara, south town. Uh, we're looking at the island of Unce, the most northerly island because that's where we'll find Mucklefluga. And there is a wee bit of interest here oh. because uh, some of the Scottish lighthouses were built by a, a couple of brothers called Stevenson. And one of them had a young nephew who was a writer. And this writer went out to one of the places where they were quarrying and carving these interlocking pieces of granite. And while he was out there, he wrote a story that featured the very island on which he was based. Uh, the writer's name is Robert Louis Stevenson. You may perhaps know him. The story is Kidnapped. 
and he later spent some time with his uncle up at the construction of the Muckle Flugga lighthouse. And it is widely believed that the um, inspiration for his treasure island was the island of Unz. It's about the same shape and about the same size, and he was up there and knew it, knew the island. So uh, maybe that, he's not around to ask anymore, but it's a nice story. Anyway, here's the north end of the island of Unst. Um, I have a cousin who lives here in Haraldswick, uh, Harold's Bay, named after a Viking who sailed into this inviting little uh, bay with its sandy beach and set up camp there. Um, so my cousin lives in just about the most northerly house in the whole of U the UK, but she also owns a house up here that nobody lives in. It's, it's rented out and it is the most northerly house in the whole of Britain. And Buckle Flagger is on this little strip of rocks up here. The most northerly one is literally just a, a lump of rock that is often washed over by the sea. Uh, and the Flagger, uh, Muckle Flagger, is in about here. So there it is. And this little headland is where you can see it. Well, you can actually see it from up here as well. Up on the, There's a big hill up on here and you can look across to it, but you get a better view from here. So the, the next picture is taken from this area, looking along this line of rocks. And there in the distance is Muckleflugger Lighthouse. From the sea, it looks even more forbidding. And this is the view from up top. This is the lighthouse buildings itself. And you can see on this side, there's some pretty angry waves washing about the place. Over here, it's a bit more sheltered and in here, it's completely sheltered. And that's where the, the little boat comes in. And it is just a small boat that comes in to do the relief. Everything, well, not now, it's helicopters, but uh, in my day, a little boat came in uh, with the fresh, groceries, the tins of beans, the fresh milk, the newspapers for the last two weeks, and the drums of diesel oil when that uh, time of year came that the stock of diesel oil had to be replenished. Everything had to come in here. And you would think that here's this nice big sheltered area, you could just sail right in there. Yeah, not as easy as that. The route to uh, get into the flugger uh, approaches this way, and you have to come in here. The reason for that is that there are some shallows here. And so that way is basically blocked. It looks the easy way in, but you're going to run aground if you try to come in there. And so the boatman has to learn this. And when you do it, you really hope the fellow knows what he's doing, because he has to suddenly hard a starboard and dash through this little gap in the rocks, and then hard to port and hard a stern in order to come in here and lie safely in there. And even then, they don't get a, uh, right up to the rock and tie up to the rock. They have to sit out uh, in open water um, because there are too many rocks projecting. And there's a staircase that goes up here that you can climb to get to the top. And if you think you have to carry 40 gallon oil drums up a staircase, I'm happy to say that you're wrong. They used to do it that way. They used to manhandle the things. Uh, in those days, it was uh, kerosene, but there is a more modern way of doing it. This is the a view from the other end of uh, the flugga, and you see muckle flugga here. Muckle is the word for big. Piri is the Shetland word for small. We would be on mainland Scotland, but Piri is what they would say in Shetland, and Pidi in Orkney. So this is the little precipice or cliff. This is the big precipice or cliff. And the boat, the relief boat, the small boat has to make its way in here, do that hard a starboard, and then hard to port to get into this little sheltered area. And this is what it looks like from above. Now, this is a lighthouse keeper in full uniform. This is a rare sight. This is a rare sight. They do this only when somebody uh, official is in the area or a camera is around. Most of the time, the light keepers did not dress up in uniform. There was no need to. Uh, there was nobody else there. So they didn't, you know, they would slouch around in whatever was comfortable. 
Uh, but clearly there's somebody uh, looks kind of official accompanying this keeper. But the boat comes into this area down here and you can see that although it's kind of open, there are still fangs of rock to be avoided. And this is in the days of sail. When they would sail into this place. Imagine doing that, you know, hard to starboard, then hard to port in the sailing boat and then managed to, managing to stop in time. And you can see that it doesn't tie up against the rocks. It's held in place by all these ropes. And this enormously long gangplank reaches out to the boat and they bring ashore whatever it is they need to bring ashore, whether it's men or food or fuel or whatever. Fortunately, uh, that disappeared and power came in. And so the, the, more recently, the boat, pretty well the same boat, but now with a little diesel engine in it, uh, runs out or ran out to the flogger. And they had a system for getting stores up to the top of the cliff. And this is what it would look like. On a calm day like this, this uh, hoist arrangement, and I'll, I'll explain how it works in a moment, but with this hoist arrangement, in calm weather, you could literally swing ashore. They could pull you over so that you could grab onto this ladder. And that's how I got, got ashore. I went out there twice, and on both occasions, I was able to hang on to this ladder. Uh, and I had to climb up all the stairs, yes. I, but I was young, and I could do that in those days. I don't think I really would want to nowadays. But this is how this hoist is how in bad weather, men and material, the 40 gallon oil drums or whatever, uh, would be hoisted up to the lighthouse. There was a winch at the top. And I've got some very crude graphics to explain how it works. This is slightly rougher weather. And they do appear to be grabbing the guy and hauling him in so that although he's suspended here, they can pull him to the side and get him ashore. And they have other stuff here that's either come ashore or is about to uh, go off, probably coming ashore in this picture. Uh, if the weather gets much rougher than this, and there isn't much here, but if it gets much rougher than this, they couldn't get in. This is how this thing works. Uh, you're seeing it from the other angle, but essentially there's a big wire rope that stretches from the rocks at the bottom to the rocks at the top. And down near the bottom, there's this block which just stops anything from going past it. And the boat sits down here, held off from the rocks by all these ropes. And at the top, they have a pulley system that makes its way down. As you let out the yellow rope, this thing comes down the red wire rope until it hits the block. When it hits the block, it can't go any further, so it stays there. And as you continue to let the yellow rope out, the hook drops down. And you can attach a harness with a man attached to that, or you can hook it into a net with oil drums or uh, crates of baked beans or whatever it is that is coming ashore. And then to pull it up, you just pull on the yellow rope, which pulls the hook up. It can go only a certain distance, and then the whole thing travels back up to the top. So up at the top was somebody with a winch operating the winch. That made sure that if the ones down below got washed away by a freak wave, there was somebody there to keep that light going. Uh, and down at the bottom, they had a system of signaling to the man at the top so that uh, if he couldn't see exactly what was going on, they, they could tell him, pull in, let out, uh, and so on. And of course, at the top, he had to swing the stuff over to the side and unload it. Um, but that's the system. And I have to confess, I, I was out there twice. As I say, on both occasions, I was able to be pulled over to the side and uh, then was able to get across and climb the ladder to the top. Uh, on one occasion, they were taking ashore empty oil drums the second time I was out there. And somehow one of them got loose and fell out and fell into the sea and the wind carried it away. The boat promptly cast off and headed off to get the floating oil drum, forgetting that I was still ashore. That too is a cardinal sin because I wasn't supposed to be there. I was visiting my uncle who was the head keeper at the time. So he promptly got on the radio and said, boys, forget the oil barrel for the moment. We have a visitor to get rid of first. 
<laughs> so they had to come back and hook in and uh, get me aboard the boat and then go and retrieve the oil barrel and uh, all ended up well. But the weather can change in a very short time. So the rules are there for a reason. Just to put some perspective on the weather up in this part of the world, my uncle reported uh, that every three or four years they'd get a really bad winter storm and the waves, the water would crash up to the height of the of the, the base to the, the accommodation block with its wall around it and here quite literally the wall around it was to stop uh, to prevent keepers from being blown away by the wind but the water would splash up over that wall and sometimes damage it and they'd have sometimes have to get uh, fresh bricks out and uh, repair a, a section of wall before the following winter uh, and the, the records show that you know at least every five years but every two three years maybe four years they get a storm of that magnitude just to put that in perspective a storm of that magnitude uh, waves of that height coming into the Hudson River would get into the Statue of Liberty to knees or maybe just above knee height. That's a pretty big wave. And the tallest lighthouse in Connecticut is the one that marks the entrance to New London. And there would be nothing left of it. Uh, it's not designed, of course, uh, for duty out in the ocean. It, uh, as far as I know, it's brick uh, because it isn't facing waves of that magnitude. But these are pretty big waves. And can you imagine what it's like to be sitting on that lighthouses, lighthouse with a big storm and the waves, the tops of the waves uh, coming over the, the wall from time to time? And you've got to get out of the accommodation block and over to the, the tower. Uh, and you know, in the top of the tower with hurricane force winds and just a thin sheet of glass between you and that. Um, I didn't see any of that because I was there for summers, but yeah, that must have uh, that must have tested one's courage uh, more than a little. Okay, back to the the US, and you've probably heard of this. This is one of the four point six things that you did know. Down in Cape Hatteras in North Carolina, they have a walking lighthouse. Well, it once walked. The problem here is not quite so much sea level rise but certainly coastal erosion and the coast uh, along here was being eroded quite badly you can see that groins have been put in these little walls that you see on some beaches uh, these are groins designed to capture the sand a beach is essentially a river of sand the grains on the sand are always being moved in one direction or the other in this case they're always being moved up in this direction uh, but on any beach, there is always an end where the sand is arriving and an end where the sand is disappearing. So it's always moving sideways across the beach. And in this case, the lighthouse was threatened. So after some negotiation and deliberation and designing and raising money, in 1999, they decided, or they were able to move it. The decision was made some years earlier, but they were able to move the whole lighthouse. Well. They could move Atlas rockets down in Cape Canaveral, so moving a lighthouse isn't all that different. You simply put wheels underneath it, build itself, a, build yourself a roadway, and move it all the way back here, where now it now sits and has for the last twenty years. And when they put it there, they reckoned that it would be at least a hundred years before they might have to move it again. And that's the scary bit because what they're saying really is that. All of this is going to be gone in a hundred years, along with all the homes that are off to the right. And I don't know that I would want to live anywhere near that, but that's what they were able to do. Move the Cape Hatteras lighthouse. Automation has taken over lighthouses. Uh, in my day, uh, lighthouses had, there were actually two kinds. There were the, the kinds like Muckle Flugger, and uh, high school where only the light keepers lived and there were lighthouses like uh, Plada where the families could live too and they were classified as shore stations uh, the others are classified as rock stations and light keepers you know it's like any other 
profession. Um, you get to know other people um, that are close knit group. Uh, you know, men are going to go out there and spend three weeks seeing nobody else but each other. Sometimes just two of you. Ruval was a two man station. There was me and one other fellow. I was there for 12 weeks. Every two weeks, somebody else chain, you know, uh, came out. Um, by the time I'd been out there eight weeks, the first fella uh, I'd been out with was back out having had his holidays. Uh, but when there's just two of you there, that's all you have to talk to. That's all that you're going to see for all that time. So it's a strange way of life. And it's now gone. The, the UK automated in 1988 and the US uh, finished automation in 1989. So all of them are now automatic. This is the ship that took me out to High Scar Light and did most of the uh, island reliefs. This is the one that came out with however many uh, oil drums you needed of uh, diesel oil for the, the year's supply of uh, fuel for the generators. And she's called the Fingal, and she's based in the uh, west coast town of Oban, which is where I used to live. So I would see this almost every day, except when she was out at sea. And uh, she looks like a seagoing ship, and, and it's comforting. You know that if the weather's bad, this ship is going to get there. She just looks competent. Indeed, when I was due to come off uh, Ruva, uh, off Heisker after 12 weeks, the weather was kicking up. and the Fingal came out and various uh, supplies. We had been building this bridge, so there was a cement mixer and all sorts of things to be taken off. And the rule is the man coming ashore is the first thing to be delivered. And the man coming off is the last thing to be taken off. You can understand why. So the weather was kicking up. The Fingal had to move round to the sheltered side of the high skirt to make it easier to get the boat back. And of course, the boat that goes ashore and takes things ashore is this little thing here like the one that you saw at Flugger. And uh, so they came for me at last and got round and were bouncing up and down. And we came alongside and one minute you're looking at the rail and the next minute you're admiring the red lead paintwork of the, as the ship and the, uh, the little, this little boat bounce back and forth. And they told me, we'll tell you when to jump. We're not leaving it to you. We'll tell you when to jump. And when we jump, we mean jump. So we bounced up and down a few times and eventually they said jump and I, I got aboard and they got aboard and hauled the thing and we got back. But the Fingal has retired and this is a, a view of her uh, as they were stripping her down and repainting her because they weren't quite sure what to do with her. But doesn't that look like a, a seagoing boat? Doesn't that look like something that'll take weather? Uh, as I say, lightkeepers were pretty confident that the Fingal would get there with their supplies, would get them uh, ashore. They didn't care so much if it couldn't get them on the, the rock, but it, they certainly wanted to be taken off the rock. And the lighthouse uh, tender Fingal is still afloat. And if you go to Scotland and go to Edinburgh, you will find that uh, just about the most expensive rooms uh, in Edinburgh are the Balmoral Hotel above Waverley Station. It's the one where Sean Connery used to go when he was in Scotland. And the Fingal, which is now a boutique hotel down in the docks of Leith, just down the hill from Edinburgh. And she doesn't look the same, does she? I mean, she just, uh, just doesn't look the same. The hull is still the same. The hull still has those elegant flowing lines, but, well, it's a different purpose, isn't it? So I suppose she looks okay. This is the dining area under here and the cabins uh, are, are back here. And I think it costs somewhere in the region of $500 a night and you don't even get a free breakfast for that. This is her replacement. And this, uh, well, if the Pharos, the lighthouse uh, off Alexandria was uh, style over function. This is certainly function over style. This this is very definitely a work boat. And it has this huge crane thing um, because its job is different. It's no longer ferrying men out there. Helicopters do that. Uh, in my day, there were no helicopters. They had been invented, but they just weren't using helicopters. Uh, so this is fulfilling a different role. And part of that role we can 
glimpse from the fact that she has two of these bow thruster things to help keep her in position. The US equivalent is this, again, a very functional looking boat. And this is the Tillamook uh, lighthouse off the coast of Oregon. But again, you know, this is not a particularly stylish thing. This is function over style. But both of those ships spend most of their time dealing with this. This side of the Atlantic, you tend to call them buoys. I call them boys. And they lift these out of the water and inspect them, service them, replace them. So it's a different job altogether. And now we come to the sad tale. At this point, those of you with a delicate disposition may wish to just opt out altogether, because this is where I have to confess that I was involved in all this. I was 12 years old, and it was my first experience of a condom. Not in the way you might think, but it was my first experience. And it took place on the last lighthouse that we're going to look at, the Bresse Light, at the, uh, well, kind of in the middle of Shetland. The light is at the entrance to the harbour here at Lerick, the capital of Shetland. And between World War II and North Sea Oil in the early 70s, Shetland waters were full of fishing boats. The Soviets had factory ships and a fleet of fishing boats which would occasionally come ashore for a night ashore, which basically meant they all wanted to get, get as drunk as possible. The Russians also had a water tanker that would come ashore occasionally to fill up so that they could replenish both the factory ships and the fleet. And Bressa Light sits here on the southern approach to the harbour. So very often the Russian trawlers would sail in past. And this is Bressa Light, and at this time my uncle was in charge of Bressa Light. And I discovered there that they always kept a watch out for the Russian trawlers. And when a Russian trawler was spotted coming in, they watched it closely to see if it was going to pass or if it was going to nose into these rocks just about here. And if they saw it slowing down, they would rush out. Well, the second morning I was there, my uncle saw it slowing down, grabbed a bag in one hand, grabbed me by the other, and we rushed down here. And he emptied the contents of the bag onto the grass and handed me a handful of condoms and said, and, the, and the, the rest of the bag was full of cartons of cigarettes. And he said, put the cigarettes in the condoms. And I said, what, one cigarette in each? No, he said, no, no. I said, a packet? No, he said, the whole carton, put the whole carton in the condom. I said, that'll go in this? He said, yes, it'll go in the, get on with it and tie a knot when you're finished. So I'm busy getting the, condoms over the cartons of cigarettes and he's busy negotiating with the the crew who are right up on the bow of the the trawler and they're offering bottles of vodka and we've got cartons of cigarettes and so having finished my tasks uh, the, the, the latter part of it bottles of vodka were flying around uh, the Russians had this amazing capacity to throw bottles so they landed bottom first on a nice uh, peat bank here and the combination of the heather and the soft peat meant the bottles didn't break if they landed neck first they might have but i never saw one break, uh, break. and my job was then to throw the cartons of cigarettes aboard the trawler and this is the big confession but and it's good for the soul so i'm going to feel better having been able to tell you this and the statute of limitations has run out on it anyway, but I have to point out that no duty was paid on the incoming vodka and no export duty was paid on the outgoing cigarettes. Smuggling on a grand scale. And I was part of it. But I'm free of that now. My life has changed. And that's my tale of lighthouses. And I hope you found at least 10 things in there that you didn't know about lighthouses before. And if you've got questions on these or any other things to do with lighthouses, I will do my best to answer them. So how do they get the automation onto the, onto the islands? Well, there, there's already a certain amount of equipment there. So the automation, um, the, the lighthouses were all converted to electricity. They still run off electricity. They still run off diesel generators. 
they still have to be refueled every so often but the diesel generators in my day every morning you had to pump uh, fuel from the main um, store the main tanks up to a header tank which carried enough fuel for that day so every day you started up one of the three generators uh, pumped up the fuel for it switched the fuel flow to that generator and got it going and it would run for 24 hours the next day you would come in and pump up to the header tank and switch it to the second generator and get it going now all that is done done automatically in the case of some of the smaller ones they've been able to use solar panels and oh. batteries and keep them going that way uh, some of them even have very bright leds so that the, oh. the uh, power consumption is very small and the lighthouses carry a huge amount of automation so that every aspect of what's going on is monitored. If a pump fails, if the flow, uh, well, they can even tell when the filters and the fuel need changed because the, the pumps start draining a bit more current as they're working harder to get through uh, a, a filter that is in, increasingly blocked. They never let it get completely blocked, of mm. course. So there's a huge amount of automation uh, out there to allow them to monitor things. And every so often they fly out when the weather allows and land a, an engineer or an artificer, as they call them. And there are still there's still accommodation. So if the helicopter has to go and leave him or if the job is going to take him some time, he can mm -hmm. stay there and fend for himself, cook for mm -hmm. himself and so on. Yeah. So getting it out there, the, much of it went out by boat. And then these days, most of it goes by air. But if there's anything big that has to go out, they can still uh, take the, the boat out there and get it ashore. Thank you. Very, very informative. Thank you so much. Wonderful presentation. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you. There is a question. Um, Tom, uh, Valerie is asking, how many uncles did you have or did the same one move around? Oh, it's the same uncle. He moved to several lighthouses and uh, I always, well, uh, most of them I managed to get out and see him. Um, I quite enjoyed traveling to some of these places. Uh, I mean, not many people have been to Flugger. Um, not many people in Scotland have been out to Muckle Flugger, although more have more recently, you know, as the population gets more affluent and the roads and the transport gets better. In my day, getting out to Shetland um, on one trip, uh, I managed to get a lift with an engineer that was coming up from the south and he'd flown into the airport and there was a special taxi run that involved taxis and ferries to get him from the airport at the south of end of Shetland all the way up to Muckleflugga. So I joined in this uh, run and on the plane he'd met uh, an Air Force engineer who was going to a radar station that is also up on the island of Anst. And the aircraft, the, the, this uh, RAF person was complaining bitterly because he'd been posted from Cornwall, where Joe Biden is at the moment in the southwest of England. Uh, he'd been posted from there up to the other end of uh, Britain. And it, he was on his third day of travel. He said, I can get to Australia faster than this. <laughs> So in those days, you know, between the train journeys and, and all the rest of it, and they wouldn't fly yeah. him, it was the Air Force, but they, they weren't going to fly him. Uh, so he was really miffed that he'd spent three days trying to get there. Um, these days, it's a lot easier to get to these places. But uh, yes, I went to see him at various lighthouses and uh, I was able to do watches for him. It's a novelty in a way for me. It gave him a bit of extra sleep, saved his knees a bit. Uh, when he could use younger knees um, and it was always interesting. Well it sounds more than interesting it sounds like it was a huge adventure certainly from our perspective my perspective um, but it was not a calling for you you, you it's not something you thought you might want to do when you grew up. No uh... No, it, it was an excellent summer job uh, for a student. I, I really couldn't have done better. My brother, who's four years younger, tried it uh, when in you know in his turn, but he didn't even last two weeks. He couldn't stand the solitude. You know, yeah. you're stuck out there. There's you and one other person, and you're doing four-hour watches, so you're spending a lot of the time, most of the time, on your own. 
Um, the rule is that uh, the man coming off watch makes the tea, the coffee, the sandwich, the cookie, whatever, for the man coming on. So you know, you've, you've said, yeah, uh, this morning I want this, that, and the next thing. And so uh, his job is to make it for you and your job is to have something ready for him when he comes on watch. And then who, whoever's on watch in the morning makes breakfast, whoever's on watch in the evening makes dinner. Um, you know, you, you get into that kind of routine and you just oh. hope the other person's just a better cook than you are. <laughs> well, Alice has a question. Uh, she wants to know whether you can tell us about cleaning the light at the top. And she asks, as someone afraid of heights, um, how is uh, that? I too am afraid of heights. Uh, whenever I went to a lighthouse, the first thing I had to do was to go up the tower. You go up to the light room uh, if you look behind me, you can see a, a typical lighthouse. And uh, if you can see my hand here, or, or you, know, you can't. Oh, yes, there we are. Can you see my finger? Yeah. So you go up here, and there's always a balcony up here around the light room. And the light room is actually below the lantern. There's the glass area where the light comes out at the top. And below that is the light room with the clockwork mechanism. And that's where the radio is, the, the VHF communications radio, not a broadcast uh, receiver. Um, and that's where the log book is, where you log what's going on and so on. Uh, the first thing I always had to do was to get out onto that balcony. And there's always a, a little ladder that takes you up onto the top. The black bit at the top, right at the top, is a cast iron hemisphere. And it has little handles and rungs on it. And the first thing I always had to do was to climb up there and touch the weather vane right on top. Uh, white knuckle job all the way but if I did that as the first thing there then I knew I could get out on the balcony at any time. On the larger lighthouses the, the area where the light comes out that glassed area halfway up is a narrow brass walkway of perforated brass and it's about a foot wide and every few days somebody has to go up there with a bucket of water and a brush because seagulls frequent lighthouses and the light has to get out and so the glass has to be clean. So there's a handrail and there's this one foot wide walkway. You have one hand on the handrail and one on the brush and your feet push the bucket ahead of you as you go round and you scrub the, the glass clean. And if you let go, you might manage to land on the balcony, but you may very well go over the edge. Uh, so I had to do that. Uh, the other thing is uh, when I got to high school, they hadn't finished painting it white for that year. And so they had to lower me over the edge of the balcony on a rope uh, with a knot at the bottom of it. And sitting on top of the knot is a board with a hole in it. And the, ro the, the rope goes through the hole and the knot underneath holds the board in place. And you sit on that board, one hand on the rope. There's a, a little bucket of whitewash and a brush and you hang on to the rope for like grim death and you paint the thing and they, they lower you down uh, when you've well, done one bit you tell them and they lower you down and for somebody who's not got a head for heights that was pretty terrifying. Mm -hmm. Latterly they put climbing harnesses on and safety ropes and all that kind of thing but in my day it was one guy at the top with his big rope and you at the other end with a brush and that was it. <laughs> Some of these lighthouses were f could could accommodate families, right? The light lighthouse keeper would have his family. Not the towers. I mean, the this this one behind me is a tower, so that was the light keepers only. But uh, Plada that we saw at the beginning had an accommodation block there. Uh, so did Ruval, but Plada the families were able to go out to uh, Ruval. No, it was just the light keepers. So it depended. I mean, the, uh, in the case of high school, for example, the families lived in Oban, the base for the, the, the Fingal. So it made sense for the place where the ship was based to be the place where the families were based. Any other questions, people? Do you have any experience of lighthouses or anything to share? Anyone? I have a question, Tom. Did you have yes. a family during the years when you were a light keeper? I was a student. Oh, you were a student. 
Yeah. So you finish this, the academic year finishes in uh, at the end of June. Uh, you might have a couple of days and then July, August and September, you're out on a light and then you get back, uh, you know, at the beginning of October for the start of the, the year and your first lectures or whatever. So, yes, it was uh, July, August, September. Okay, it's pretty exciting. Sounds exciting. Well, one bit of excitement wreck? I had was... Did you ever have a Sorry. shipwreck? Did you ever have a shipwreck that you had to go out and save? Well, no, it wasn't the lightkeeper's job to do that. Uh, what you do is you call it in and the lifeboats come out. Um, or if it was a cliff rescue, the coast guards might do it because they don't have it. Well, they, they, nowadays they have inshore rescue boats, but uh, no, in the case of a shipwreck, it would be the, the lifeboat that would come out. I did have one little bit of excitement. Uh, lighthouses often, certainly places like Ruval, had a mast from which a flag could be flown. And the lighthouse has its uh, service has its own flag. And I was told that there are some uh, NATO warships in the area. There were Dutch minesweepers. There was, I think, six of them. And they were visiting Oban and they were sailing back down and they would be passing us back sometime in the next two or three days. And the drill is uh, you dip the flag and salute to the passing warships, whatever nationality they are. So uh, they just happened to come down and it was my watch and I was on. So I saw them in the distance and uh, got down to the flag and put the flag up. And as the first warship drew us uh, a beam of us, I dipped the flag and they promptly dipped theirs and I raised my flag again. And the second warship came a beam and I dipped the flag and nothing much happened, but there was a scurrying of activity and eventually they managed to dip their flag. But this time the third one was along or a beam, so I dipped the flag and they managed to dip and so did the, the rest. So uh, when the next man came on, I reported that this has happened and he said, you did what? I said, I dipped the flag to the warships. How did you do it? And I explained and he fell about laughing because apparently the rule is that you dip to the leading ship only. And of course, the second ship didn't expect <laughs> to have to reply to a dipped flag. And of course they had to reply because that's the etiquette, etiquette and they didn't want to offend anybody. Uh, so they must've been laughing themselves silly in, in all six warships, such is my claim to fame. <laughs> well, Alice has another question. She wants to know how you spent your first uh, paycheck doing lighthouse duty. <laughs> My first paycheck went on a guitar. I had been oh. lusting after this guitar for a year. And as a student, you don't have much money. So the, I, I had to go to Edinburgh to get my uh, check. And I got the check and I went to the bank and paid it in. And in those days, it was a dead simple process. You had a little book and they wrote something in your book and they wrote it in their book. And I cashed some of it and walked further down the street in Edinburgh to the a shop that I knew sold these guitars and I bought this guitar. So that took about half of my paycheck. That's a lovely story. You could have then, I, I could, you, presumably you could take your guitar with you to your next lighthouse assignment. I did, I did. You, yeah, there you go. And much to well, the amusement of the light keepers. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, what, when everything became automated, uh, a whole bunch of them got laid off, right? Or was it, was it already a kind yes. of... Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, they, they were automated. They went all automated at once. It took some time. It took a few years. They were gradually. So when I say they were automated, what I mean, really mean is the last ones to be automated were automated. Um, it, it, they started with the the ones that were easier to reach and so on. The technology was developing. So the last ones to be automated were usually the more remote ones where they really wanted to be sure that the technology would work properly. Uh, several light keepers found a job in a lighthouse museum uh, in a, an old lighthouse north of Aberdeen. And when I went to see that and explained that I had been a keeper, they took me into the back and showed me some of the stuff they had and I I had known some of the keepers they had known. So it was a very pleasant experience. Uh, it was worth, worth, very worthwhile. 
And uh, one more question. Why does Michigan have 115 plus whatever lighthouses? Uh, basically, I think it's the, the traffic from Chicago um, going up north uh, and round the top and then heading down. It's basically heading for the St. Lawrence Seaway. Uh, there is a, a lot of traffic up there. And in the days before radar, remember radar really only came into its own at the end of World War II. At the beginning of World War, up until the beginning of World War II, everything was visual. Uh, everything was visual sightings. Even aircraft mm -hmm. found it difficult to fix their position in bad weather. So uh, sorry, I think sorry, it's a combination Tom. of the weather and the importance of the traffic. Sorry, yes, Tom, I, I happen to know that that's not the whole reason. Ah. Michigan's got a, a tremendously okay. long coastline. It's one of the longest coastlines in the States because of the way the coast runs. And that's why it has so many, I'm guessing that's why right. it has so many lighthouses. Uh, but it's, uh, if you look up- It does have map, a long coastline, yeah. Yeah, but not just because of the, the size of the state, but because of the way the coastline runs. We have a cottage on Lake Huron on the Canadian mm -hmm. side, so okay. I have to know that. So anyway, thank you though. It was a great talk. Really okay, appreciate thank it. you. Yeah. Well, thanks. It was a I learned something new every day. <laughs> well, it's it was a wonderful talk, um, Tom. Thank you so much. Um, and I think we're, welcome. we're coming to the end of this uh, uh, presentation. So I want to thank you enormously. I think uh, am I seeing? I'm just seeing. If you'd like to experience a night in a lighthouse. You can rent a night at Rose Lighthouse in Newport, Rhode Island, or be a lighthouse keeper. This is a contribution from one of our... Uh, uh, um, yeah, our there are several uh, that are now, I mean, all of them are, all of the ones on the mainland are in private hands. You know, they've been turned into houses, some into hotels. Um, on the Hudson River, you can use the Sogarty's Lighthouse as a and b but you have to walk to it. You can't get a car to it. We so we don't know what happened to the um the three missing keepers of um Flannan Isle. But that's a wonderful nope. story. And um I just while we, people were asking questions, I Googled that. I see they made they made not surprisingly, they made a movie, a film based on that story. Yeah. And it's called The Vanishing, if people want to look for it. And of course, the poem is there, which is a lovely long poem. So do do look for that too. Tom, thank you so very much. This this has been recorded, so um, this will be on our library website for those of you who want to um, listen and watch this again. Please do and share with those who were not able to attend. And we look forward to having Tom Lawrenson back with another one of his fascinating presentations when he's ready. And meanwhile, from on behalf of all of us and on behalf of the library, thank you ever so much. Thank you, Rabia. Goodbye, everybody. Um, Have a good, night. A good night. Bye. Bye. Awesome. <laughs>